Hi. 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 Hello. Welcome to the Writers Festival and this panel on microfiction. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land, uh, the Wurundjeri people of the Kuma Nation, and pay respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and the elders of the lands that this broadcast reaches. Um, hi, welcome. I'm Julian Novitz. I'm a lecturer in writing at Swinburne University of Technology and a novelist and short fiction writer. I'm joined today by Alice Bishop, who is a writer from Victoria, um, who's currently finishing her first collection of short fiction, A Constant Hum, a work that has been recognized by the Victor and Victorian Premier's Awards, and also long-listed for the inaugural uh, Ritual Prize and the Kill Your Darlings Prize for Unpublished Manuscript in 2017. Um, you can find her essays and short stories in the Anjan, Southerly, Overland, and Lip Market magazine. Um, we're also joined by Alex uh, Menhardt, who is a writer and editor who is based in Sydney. His fiction and poetry has appeared in Voice Works, Seizure, and the UTS Writers Anthology, uh, Seeds and Skeletons. He also edits uh, Flashes, which is short, short stories and microfiction for Seizure magazine. So, Alex and Alice, thank you for joining me today. Hi. Um, hi. Right. So the topic of our panel is microfiction, um, and microfiction is uh, so short, short stories usually below 750 words in length. Um, very short pieces of writing that nonetheless could tell or at least allude to a complete um, narrative in some way, shape, or form. And microfiction is becoming increasingly important in emerging as a genre and category of fiction um, as we move into this digital period where increasingly various microblogging platforms like social media, Twitter, Facebook, push us towards condensing our language, creating shorter, sharper narratives to share um, with a potentially global audience. So I'd like to open up to, to Alice and Alex, who are actually much more experienced uh, writers of uh, microfiction and flash fiction than I am, uh, and maybe start by asking, um, Alex, how do you define a short, short story or piece of microfiction, what makes it um, distinct from a scene from a longer story or the start of a longer narrative? Well, I think there's a huge amount of definitions on the internet and anywhere you look in terms of guidebooks on what flash fiction is and what it isn't. And um, most of them, you know, there's even some variation between what flash fiction is and what microfiction is. So flash yeah. fiction is typically regarded as something less than a thousand words. And something like microfiction, I mean, although you can find a whole bunch of different definitions, it could be less than 50 words. Right. Um, so, I mean, it's, it depends on how we, whether we define flash fiction as something that's just a certain word count, you know, a certain between 50 and yeah. 1,000 words or 750 words, whatever, or whether we think it's more than that, you know, whether it's different from a vignette or a, any other type of short writing. Um, yeah. I, I personally think it is, although I don't think all flash fiction uh, couldn't also be called short fiction, that kind of thing. I mean, um, if we're looking at the, the name flash fiction, I think it's something that appears suddenly, you know, it's something that yep. feels like, yep. you know, it, it might have a lot of work put into it, but it, it feels like something that's just sort of appeared on the page. You know? so that's, a, that's a possible way of thinking about it, I think. Yeah. So I suppose in that sense, a short story is something that feels more calculated, more deeply planned, um, yeah, more intricately plotted, and a yeah. flash fiction feels like something spontaneous. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think it doesn't necessarily mean there's uh, less work that's been put in. I just think it's, you know, um, often that all that planning needs to be in before it can be condensed into something, you know, as short as. 500 words, so, yeah. Yeah, great, right, yeah, yeah. Um, and Alice, um, how, how do you, uh, what, in terms of like when you think about writing a piece of microfiction or a, a piece of flash fiction to, to vary between the terms, um, what do you think makes that piece work? What, what makes it essentially, you know, a, a complete narrative or, you know, how do you capture that kind of spontaneity that Alex is talking about here? Yeah, so I'm, I, I'm not very good at getting into definitions of flash fiction and microfiction and short stories. And um, for me, I think that it's really deceptive. A lot of times people can think that a piece of flash, 
flash fiction is um, <clears throat> um, has begun as a short piece. A lot of my flash fiction or shorter stories, I've written a three thousand word piece and then kind of whittled back, whittled it back into you know a couple of hundred words. Um, but I think that um, the lines are really blurry. The lines are really blurry between short fiction, micro fiction, poetry, um, and for me, it's not very professional probably, but I, I think word counts for certain competitions or if you're using Twitter, they can really determine, you know, how long you want a piece to be and it gives you a few of those boundaries. Um, but as I said, I think that, that the lines are really blurry and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. It can be a really, a really positive thing that it kind of can be poetry or microfiction or short fiction. Um, so, yeah, but I think getting back to the question, um, a good piece of microfiction really kind of has to hit you in the spine. It has to really capture a moment in time that that it might be fleeting and microfiction can be kind of the perfect way to, to, to do that for me, yeah. Yeah, right. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting thinking about, you know, coming down to questions of, of word count and word length, whether a, a microfiction is a story of 100 words and flash fiction is a piece below 1,000 words. Feels like there are very similar debates around novella in terms of how yeah. you to understand, yeah, yeah, the difference between a short novel and a novella or a long short story in a novella, and a lot of what it comes down to is often a question of what does it feel like. I mean, whether it creates a particular effect. Totally. Um, and, yeah, and I suppose that's very similar with with a piece of flash fiction or micro fiction. It should affect us in some particular way, in the way that an individual scene from a short story wouldn't. Um, I suppose. Uh, yeah. So, in terms of Alice, you, you mentioned that when you write a piece of, of microfiction, sometimes what you, you take it at how you begin is by starting with a three thousand word story or longer story, and then whittling it back, comparing it back um, from that to, to uh, you know just what like a, a paragraph or a few hundred words. Um, how do you make those decisions? About, about what to include and what to cut out from. I think. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah I don't. I mean, personally, I think it's such a subjective thing, editing and writing. I mean, I think for me, if, you know, I'll write a longer piece and I'll at the time think, oh my God, this is really great, and I'll put it away, that kind of cliche of put it in a drawer and think about it for a while, and then I come back to it and I reread it and go, the the main part of this story or the image that I really want to get across that has that kind of broader kind of feeling about life is really buried amongst all the other stuff that I've thrown in. And, um, and I honestly think sometimes it's just a matter of time, you know, um, just to kind of have that breath of fresh air before you go back to a piece and go, even highlighters work, highlight the pieces of the, of the story that are working and, 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 Sometimes you can take bits of that story and put them into something else, or you can break up a story into quite a few different parts of um, smaller, you know, yeah. smaller micro. And um, I think it's just really exciting that um, our lifestyles at the moment. I mean, you know, you're often kind of trying to fit in reading between the transport or work or the office, and um, and microfiction's just perfect for that you know you, you don't have to have that lack of reading but um, everything can be a bit more condensed not not to say that that means it's less effective I think yeah yeah, yeah. great great and Alex you're both um, a writer of microfiction and flash fiction and you know and you also edit the the, the flash fiction section of, of, of seizure magazine um, so you're coming at this really from both an editor and a practitioner's perspective uh, how, how do you go about crafting a piece of microfiction? Do you have a similar technique in terms of whittling down a longer story, or do you just tend to focus more on one particular scene that hits you from the outset? No, yeah, I definitely um, agree with Alice on that. So when I've, you know, often the, the flash fiction that has been any good that I've written is, is actually an accident. So it's happened because I'm trying to work on a longer piece, and then all of a sudden, you know, I'm rewriting it, rewriting it, and it ends up being that, that whatever theme was important about it ends up being able to be expressed in a short, you know, fewer than yeah. a thousand words. So yeah. I think that's you know, what we were saying earlier is like it needs to be, yeah, I mean, it, it needs to be condensed, but it needs to be, it can't be um, frivolous or something you've just come across. It, it's something that has to have been stewing for a while. Um, I mean, it doesn't need to be, but it can be something like that. And then 
Um, yeah, it, I, I think uh, that I've written, which I like it, is written in one sitting. So it's it's not something that um, you know, the the re it might have been rewritten a lot of times, but it'll just mm -hmm. happen in one sitting. So. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and of course, you mean you read a huge amount of, of probably flashbacks and submissions in any given week or month, or you work for the seizure. In terms of like what you look at, in terms of the pieces that come in, I mean, what you know, what what signals a successful piece of, of, of flash fiction for you? What kind of catches your attention um, well, from the, the, the kind of the you know the, the, the submission call? Well, the the number one thing is. When a piece is, I mean, we have a 500 word limit at Seizures. So yep. the, um, the number one thing is something less than 500 words. So the majority of submissions are, are pieces which have, which have attempted, you know, 499 words or just at that edge. Because I think a lot of people consider the, um, you know, the 500 word limit as a restriction rather than as a chance to do something different. So they've tried to, fit a longer story or something and, and shave it down, getting that 500 word limit. So if, if I see a piece and it's, I can see that it's 200 words or less, then that's immediately grabbing my attention. If, it, if it's three sentences, that's even better. That's grabbing my attention straight away. Um, doesn't mean it's, you know, we're gonna publish it or it's any good, but it's definitely um, something that's not explored as much as I think it could be. Yeah that chance to experiment with really micro fiction. Um, and I'd love to see more of yeah. those kind of pieces. So that's one thing. Um, I mean, look, the second thing is all the rules that apply to short fiction or you know, even novels apply here. So, you know, uh, efficiency, of, you know, con concise prose, all those kind of things apply as well. Um, I mean, a lot of people say that, you know, it has to be, uh, flash fiction has to be evocative or it has to be all these things, but you know, it has to get to the point straight away. And I'm not sure that's entirely true. I mean, we've had really good submissions which have been all about setting. And, and that's sort of one of the rules of flash fiction is that you don't waste so much time on setting. You don't waste time building up the scene or anything like that. But this piece, it sort of hinted at the story while setting up the the setting or the, or the whole piece, you know. Um, and I'll, I'll put a link in that for Twitter later, but um, so it's, you know, there's no, no rules around, you know, fast paced plot or any of those kind of things that I think, are, you know, you have to do this. I wouldn't be adaptive about that, but um, yeah, there's some amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. So actually, I, mean, I think the first point was really interesting in the sense that not only do they have to work within the restrictions or the limits of the form, crafting a narrative that's below, you know, less than 500 words or even shorter, um, they have to kind of embrace that limitation as well in order to really be successful and see the possibilities in that. Um, and then I, I find that quite interesting as I teach you know, a short fiction course at Swinburne. And a lot of students find, like, initially at the start of the semester, 2,000 words for a short story seemed like a lot of space and a lot of words. And what the most constant problem or complaint I get is, is running up against the limitations of the word count. And so in some respects, it becomes about teaching students to actually embrace that limitation and, and see the possibilities of how much story they can tell in, in that shape or form. And I suppose with microfiction uh, and short and flash fiction, it's, it's very similar, only you're working with much tighter constraint there. Um, yeah. Yeah, sorry. So, Alice, did I see that like, you you put put up a link to um just a yeah. sidebar there? I just when you mentioned before yeah. link to some short stories or short fiction or flash fiction that you that you like. I think that um I just I just the first one that came up in my feed ten minutes ago or something when when you said that was a good example of um um how microfiction. You know, I think as if you're studying writing or trying to be a writer, it's really easy to get bogged down in, in the rules and then you, know, you have to learn the rules to break the rules and, and Twitter is just a little bit more freeing and social media can be a bit more freeing where you can just kind of, there can be, yeah. sounds cliche, but there can be poetry in the everyday. So um, I just shared yeah. one that just popped up that um, is a, 
is a good example and, um, and it can really just change your day um, if you're seeing um, yeah. and so, you might not even yeah. classify it as micro fiction by the writer but um, yeah. I definitely read it as that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. But I bought a few of my favourite um, my favorite books along so if later people want to um, yeah. want to get into the world of, of short fiction and um, micro fiction um, I have some recommendations. <laughs> so yeah. So it's great. So I mean, I'm not sure if it's come up in the, in the feed yet, but it's by uh, Aaliyah Antigone, and, and she says, "I love Gala's The Coconut Ice of Birds," which is of course a, a lovely image there. Yeah. And, 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 yeah. and, and 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 really evocative in a really simple way. So yeah, yeah. that by the imagination, you kind of speculate on, on what that means and what experience that that's speaking towards. That's kind of like a great segue to talk a little bit about um, the types of very short fiction that are emerging by microblogging platforms like uh, Twitter and social media. Um, so, so do you feel like the the emergence of this kind of like 140 character limit in Twitter and and you know attempts at storytelling by by Twitter and new media have created new kinds of of microfiction or or very short fiction or new storytelling conventions? Right, Alice, I'll, I'll pass it to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think that um, it's such an exciting time, and I've probably for the last um, I don't know, maybe five years, I've just been so inspired by Instagram and Twitter and some of my favorite writers that I've discovered online that um, I don't know if I would have discovered any other way. Um, maybe if I was studying and or whatever, but if you're working and you're you're really wanting an easy way to kind of discover other voices than um, the ones that are kind of constantly exposed. Um, one of my favourite, um, there's a couple of writers on Instagram that I really love. One's Yessa Daily Ward. And she's got this great quote that I was actually listening to her. Um, I know TED Talks aren't that cool anymore, but I was listening to her TED Talk this morning. <laughs> and... Um, she says, I, always, I was always a writer, actually, even when I forgot that I was, um, and I used to forget a lot. And she's kind of just got so many followers on Instagram. She posts these really beautiful short stories, kind of mostly about um, what it's like to be a woman and for her how it's even more difficult to be a woman when you're a woman of colour. And then um, I think people would probably be pretty aware of Lawson Shire, who narrated um, Beyonce's Lemonade, and, and her her short fiction, um, again, it kind of blurs into to poetry as well, but um, has been really inspiring and um, really powerful. I think that I think it's a really powerful way to get audiences that maybe more traditional audiences don't see themselves as being readers or, or readers of poetry or micro fiction, and then um, Instagram and Twitter has really just opened up up that whole new world for for those yeah. artists and, and for readers as well. So yeah. it's definitely been really a really exciting time for me as a reader and a writer. So, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 I mean, Alex, good yeah, no, I totally agree with that. I also think, I mean, there's you know, Twitter and Instagram so ubiquitous nowadays. And I think, yeah, they're not formats that should be ignored at all. And yeah. I think also on that is that there's, that overlap between what is, um, you know, intentionally written as uh, literary fiction or literary microfiction or something, and then things which are, you know, sort of found stories. So you know, everyone's writing stories all the time on yeah. Twitter and Instagram. You know, they're, they're always, but, um, and I think that's you can approach, if, if you approach you know, scrolling through Twitter or Facebook even or anything, you approach it with the idea that everyone's telling stories. That gives a different perspective on on the whole experience. So you could be, um, you, know, you know, I think there's a, you know, you can have found poetry. That's the sort of thing where you, you take texts and, and make them into, um, into poetry or something like that. But I think, you, know, you can't have found short fiction or you can't really have found novels, you know, that I've seen, but you can you can have found micro fiction, I think, or found flash fiction because um, it's short enough to yeah. incorporate things you've discovered mm -hmm. on Facebook or Twitter and and um 
I think yeah. it gives more significance to the, the lives and the ideas of you know of people. So um, yeah, that's just another angle on it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's it's fascinating to look on, and we we surf you know our Facebook feeds and Twitter feeds as a matter of of daily life and daily course. But when we actually think about what people are posting, they are often these kind of what marks marks a good post on Twitter is this ability to create a complete story or image or convey you know a, a recognizable emotion in a very short space of words, which is obviously and something that just hits you and keeps you you keep in mind for the rest of the day, either shocks or makes you laugh or yeah, it makes you think about something, but but it's I suppose every day in terms of our use of social media, we are, we're building our skills and, and conveying this narrative more quickly and effectively. Um, yeah, what was I going to say earlier? Sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a moment. Yeah, so um, so obviously I think with, with, with social media, we're getting new forms of, of microfiction and short short stories, and also. Poetry, as, as Alice mentioned earlier as well, and I sort of think it's coming back to the boundaries and definitions again. Sorry, with, with microfiction, um, is there a distinction you think between, say, a prose poem or a, a short paragraph length poem and a piece of microfiction or a very short story? Do they, they again? I suppose the boundary boundaries blur, but you know, is, 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 are the effects that they're intended to to accomplish? Distinct, different, or distinct from each other, in your mind or opinion? In in my mind, um, yeah. as a reader, no, um, I, I kind of see them as, as one of the same thing. But then again, I don't have that theoretical background to make that distinction. But I think that um, I've got here one of my favourite books by Josephine Rowe. It's called um, yes. A Symphony, and and she says it's a it's a small book of poetry and prose, and so. If you look through it, um, there's kind of little sections. I don't know if you can see. Or it's a bit bright. But it really, um, yeah, so it can, you know, I think I can even tend to read more poems as microfiction if they're quite short. Um, but I think, too, for me, um, sometimes if I think it more of, more of as poetry, I find there might be that little extra bit of a barrier because I feel like, oh, maybe there's something that I'm not getting in the structure or there's something that I'm not, you know, I don't really have a formal, you know, education on poetry, so maybe maybe I'm missing the point. So if I, I look at it as microfiction, it just seems to be a more accessible um, um, format and that's a personal thing. Maybe other people are different. But, um, again, as I said, yeah, just the lines are very for me anyway so yeah yeah I think that's sorry Alex you got yeah there is that sort of thing about as you were saying before that um flash fiction and micro fiction it, the lines are blurry and that's what makes it great in some sense so with poetry you know if it's poetry then there's all these expectations about what it has to be like and then there's a whole bunch of different there's class things going on and like, it, it's just um it's too weighed down by history as well sometimes, you know. Um, whereas it doesn't seem to be the case for micro fiction, or, although the effects are often the same. So sometimes I'll read a, a poem and it'll, I'll, you know, that it almost feels like a piece of micro fiction, you know, it's, it's capturing the moment or the capturing the, you know. Yeah, well, my favorite poems always still tell that story, at least, or take a, a personal and emotional journey throughout the. Uh, what's being exposed. So in the sense there isn't that kind of clear distinction between a short short story and a poem apart from the language and the formatting and you know how it's laid out. So I can understand this idea that you know we all can relate to a story or desire story. So a short short story might be or might piece of micro fiction might be more accessible in that sense than a than a poem. Hmm. Um, yeah, yeah. Great point on that that line, yeah. Um, I just wanted to, I just, sorry, when you, I was, when you held up the, the, the book by Josephine Rowe, I just remembered that I think one of my favourite pieces of, of microfiction is actually in that, and I'm forgetting the title now, but I think it's called oh, yeah. What Happened or um, What Remained. Yeah, it was, is, oh, I, and it is just, no, go, sorry. I'm just trying to find it. It is, a, a, it is just about a house and the emptiness of a house. And it's just to think about a paragraph long um, 
but it it conveys the sense of, of something has happened in this particular location. It leaves it up to the reader to kind of understand or surmise what that was. And I regret not remembering the, the title off the top of my head. But it just connects to Alex's earlier point that that sometimes you know, a short, short story or a piece of microfiction can convey everything just through the setting, through one element of what would be considered conventionally um, a narrative. And when we think about a short story or a conventional short story, there should be a setting, there should be a plot or action that occurred, there should be character and a description, a theme, and all of these elements that all kind of work together and you have to kind of almost work through them like a checklist. Whereas I suppose with um, microfiction, you have space to focus on just one element of the narrative and see how much you can convey through that. Um, so setting can be used to tell us something about about you know the characters who might have lived there and inhabited that location, um, or yeah, yeah, or a description of a character can tell us something about their world within the milieu. So I suppose it's about in a sense about trying to convey as much as you can just through focusing very closely on one element of the story. So just just related to that actually, for both the question for both of you, when you when you write a piece of microfiction, I mean, Alice, you talked very much about having whittle a story down to just its most essential elements. I mean, how much else do you need to know about your characters, about their situation, about about what's going on in their lives beyond just what you you put on the page in, in order for the piece of microfiction to work? Um, maybe. maybe yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no, I, I was. I think it's more substantial than people think. Maybe like it, it's. It could be um, something. It, it, like I was saying before, it's something that happens suddenly that you know you've been thinking about for quite a while. I suppose. So, um, I think, yeah, I think for me, it, it's often a sense of like having a, a really good grasp of of, of what the, um, the meaning of the piece will be, and then that to sort of coming out on the page so um but then look again like a lot of instances people i think um you know, they, they, they it's almost like an epiphany for them straight away and they just write it down you know so it, it um it varies from different writers i think yeah yeah excellent yeah yeah so obviously yeah sometimes you have the whole story in your Okay, if you extend a narrative and other times for different writers it might just yeah um yeah emerges more kind of you know mysterious kind of segment from a longer narrative um yeah so alex in terms of in terms of you obviously you you read a lot of a lot of microfiction kind of professionally um where do you feel yeah sorry, me from that. yeah um where do you feel uh <laughs> Um, writers tend to go go wrong with um, a, a piece of microfiction where, in a sense, you read it and you feel like this is something from a longer story. It doesn't feel complete in and of itself. What are the most common, common you know, problems you encounter as an editor? Um, yeah, I would definitely say, you know, like I said before, people not embracing the flash fiction format. Um, things like, um, yeah, you know, uh, uh, you know, trying to write. Oh, sorry, let me explain. Yeah. yeah, I think there's issues when writers don't um, they don't think about it from the perspective of the editor. So, like, an edit editor is looking for writing which is yeah. immediately yeah. Gets attention. You know, so so there's one piece we we had which I love. It it always sticks in my mind. It's the first sentence is on Monday gravity ceased to work. Yeah. So yeah. Already from that, that's almost yeah. that's almost a story in its in itself. Yeah. You know, that's almost like from that you can imagine what happens next. So that first sentence is crucial always. You know, um, you know that's, that that story. You know, it it didn't. You know, in, Incredible characterization. Um, the setting wasn't fleshed out. It was only a hundred word story or something. Yeah. But yeah. already there's this clarity and it's setting up the situation, um, yeah. which is 
which can evolve. So I think you know, there's no there's no room for sort of an idea which isn't already fleshed out in your mind. It has you have to yeah. really know what you want to write about, um, and that doesn't mean it, ha it has to be like a realist fiction thing where it's just like there's not yeah. there is room for ambiguity definitely, but um, yeah, it it needs to be. Um, and then look, we we get some great. There's, there's people who are into like surrealist fiction and that surrealist narrative. They seem to be drawn to the medium a lot because it's yeah. good enough for people to maintain interest in that. You know, it's hard to sustain this ambiguous narrative for a, a short story or even a, a novel length. Um, yeah, so people yeah. get some really interesting ones. Like there was one where it's a, about um, a praying mantis who's being filmed and you're watching this praying mantis make a sandwich, you know, it's, it's really weird stuff like that, but it's, yeah. just, it just works, you know? Um, yeah. So, so, so it's really experimentation is, is what I, I like to see a lot. You know? um, yeah. There's this, I mean, I look, we get a lot of realist fiction. So a lot yeah. of stuff which is uh, either, you know, lived experience or, um, you know, has a, a typical Australian suburban setting, you know, and some, sometimes they can work, but we, we really do get a lot of those, so. Uh. <laughs> and maybe, maybe there's not enough space for that kind of surrealist, kind of magical realist fiction in, in Australian publishing at the moment. I mean, I know, um, yeah, as a, as a reader, maybe I'm a bit too conservative like that. I often like to read you know, Helen Garner and I like to read Richard Ford and, and Raymond Carver and, and, and yeah. yeah, and I don't really branch out as much as, as much as I should and um, and I think platforms like Seizure and and Overland and, and there's a whole bunch of, of great publications out there that are that are giving space to um, to different genres that, that um, are getting a bit neglected. Yeah, yeah. No, and I suppose there's there's just really a space for that kind of experimentation in a in piece of my profession. You don't have to spend, you know, 3,000 words or a full length novel justifying, you know, grav gravity failing to work and what the implications would be. You can leave that to the imagination and their speculation and just give them that kind of image and, and let them work with it. Um, so there's, there's the freedom to explore actually this kind of the, these very sort of strange territories um, in, in my conviction, much as I think we often see with some of the, the absurdist humour that we encounter in, in social media, like the you know uh, satirical tweets that that um, you know just just present us with it with a completely bizarre idea or or image. Um, you know, like, like I remember one from a while back with, with, with somebody posting something like. Um, my budget is two hundred dollars on food, two hundred dollars on rent, three thousand dollars on candles. Someone was good at the economy. Please help. My family is dying, and you know you don't need that. That is kind of like a story in and of itself, um, and you don't need to actually think through about the realism of that. You, you can just enjoy that kind of absurdity in a way that you can with a, with a longer piece of fiction. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think so that it's like I think that's what you know literary fiction rarely or it does but i mean even in the microfiction realm it, it's rare to have something that's humorous or funny you know yeah. when it's not got that label i think you find most of those you know, memes or are um just stories that are on twitter and facebook but they, they want to make people laugh like that's that's their main um intention and that, that's you know the form of validation that i look for um, and I think that's, it's an interesting thing for literary writers to consider, I think, um, that, you know, yeah. funny is, you know. Yeah, yeah. Because, I mean, particularly, I think, in Australian and New Zealand literature, um, because we're trying to define ourselves still after, you know, even 100 years old, we, we tend to shy away from, from humour, from, you know, absurdism, um, which is often the mark of more Sure, like literary, um, literary climates that, that we can we can laugh. We see, you know, 
like this, this moving away from the, the high seriousness is often being kind of trivial when humor has its own kind of politics and, and perspective that it offers. And perhaps like, you know, microfiction is often a, 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 good, a good form for exploring that kind of strangeness and absurdity and humor, um, both in their literary publications or, or just to find on the internet. Um, yeah, yeah. So in terms of in terms of like thinking maybe about about realist microfiction, I mean, what are some common common threads and topics that that people tend to focus on that maybe you know have been explored thoroughly or, or could be um, or, or could be you know overexposed in that sense? Hmm. I think for for microfiction and women, microfiction is a really and and minorities as well as it's a really powerful platform because perhaps through tradi traditional channels some voices aren't necessarily heard as much and um and i think also it's it, it's yeah through instagram and through twitter there's, there's a really big growing community of of a kind of new generation of, of female writers it's that's really exciting i mean i think when anyone Watching, you probably know Rupi Kaur. Um, she's a, I think she's Canadian. Um, she's a New York Times bestseller, and and she's amazing. Some of us have explored like all of our stuff. So you have the good with the bad, but um, but I, I, I'm really, I think I spoke about this um, recently. It's just like, it's really interesting to see the kind of backlash to her success, and 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 really that backlash doesn't mean anything when you've sold millions of books. <laughs> um, so she's quite emotional, quite quite raw and, and quite feminine and, and kind of tackles the absurd the absurdity of being a woman um, um, in, in the Western world and um, and and I think that that's a really big trend um, also with um, Yarasa Daily Ward and um, Warson Shire and um, all of these really really brilliant um, writers that that yeah again poetry microfiction are really really the strengths um where they shine i guess so so that for me is like a really really exciting time and again i think it's a really positive thing for a lot of women to be reading really short stories yeah. about, about women's experiences that 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 aren't often written about so for me that's that's um, again i'll say it again it's a really exciting time yeah yeah, yeah. great um Alex, would you like to sort of speculate on, on you know, what are, what are some com common threads or themes you encounter in, in microfiction today and perhaps what, what maybe even some themes you think could be explored or, or you'd like to see explored more, more frequently? Sorry, me or Alice? I was named this way too soon. Alex, you go. Yeah. Oh, me? Um, Alex. Sorry, Alex. You go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh, no, um, well, I mean, like I was saying before, I, I think um, microfiction has been embraced by you know, the alternative literature sort of community. Because um, it's the way we sort of digest information these days as well. Um, and I think, yeah, it, it's a format for, for almost deconstructing the the strangeness of the society we live in at the moment in little moments of parody and you know yeah. people like Sam Pink and um, Oliver Mole that are sort of we've been trying to you know yeah. express you know the um sorry I'm issues and that kind of thing with our so I think that's that's quite interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Yeah. Um, one, one question I wanted to ask, which was kind of uh, a technical question about, about microfiction, perhaps, perhaps more connected to flash fiction and some of these, these sort of longer pieces or, or short, short stories around sort of about 750 or 1,000 words. Um, Find in that story between um, summary and scene. So summary being kind of condensed action, where you know you're, you're sort of summarizing a series of events or backstory in the narrative, and scene being 
um, a moment that's fleshed out in, in real time that, that presents its kind of where, where we get kind of dramatic description of the of the, the event. Um, are there particular rules, do you think, or, or challenges around the use of, uh, of movement between summary and scene in a piece of short, short fiction or uh, a piece of microfiction? As I mean, the convention in a short story is that you should have dramatized the action as much as possible. You should, you know, a, a, a good short story should have as little summary often as, as it possibly can and just be all kind of real-time action. But do you think is there, there a difference with, with microfiction in that respect? For me, anyway. that's a tricky question. Yeah. <laughs> for me, I yeah. probably apply the same rules for short fiction that yeah. 700 words to microfiction. It just means you have to work that little bit harder to kind of, to kind of, get the whole picture in place. Um, but again, kind of what I touched on before, my process, and it's also so, so, so subjective. Some people will work by a plan, but um, it's really a matter of trial and error. And um, if you, something that I do that's kind of dorky is that if I write a piece and if say it's 700 words and I'm reading it on the screen, um, you can sometimes print it out and read through a different pair of eyes because even just the different format will make you look at it in a different way. And I think that if you kind of try to read your piece and go, okay, I know nothing, put everything you know about it aside, I'm coming to this fresh, um, is anything kind of not going to make sense to the reader or, or am I kind of filling in the, the kind of backstory um, myself in doing that work? And, and that's kind of coming back to that time thing and sometimes it's good to just, to just pop it aside and to, to revisit it. Um, um, later, but um, Alex might have a different um, yeah. opinion. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I totally agree with that as well. Um, yeah, and I think, I think it's not really in the spirit of flash fiction to have this huge piece and then, you know, chop it. Yeah. Oh, but I think... And summarize it, yeah, I guess. Yeah, and summarize it. It's not really in the spirit of it, but I think it, having a longer piece and then thinking about it, well, should this be a longer piece or should this be you know, yeah. a really short piece? Um, and I think you know, have, having the option to do that is, is quite liberating as well. I mean, we. I mean, I, I mean, short fiction has been around for short short fiction has been around for you know a very long time. It just hasn't been sort of labelled as such, really. Um, but having you know, people, I think the fact is that people just didn't read it in the volumes that they are now, and I think it's a really great trend that we're seeing people um, embrace it. I mean, there's so many micro fiction journals out there now, and like. The New Yorker publishes my profession. You know, it's it's what people are doing. I think there's you know a big reason for that. You know, that's, um, but it just it is one of the best formats um, to express what sort of not only the current social climate but um you know really powerful personal moments and that kind of thing. So there's a whole range of reasons, but yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's absolutely true. I think it's, it's a really interesting point to make because um, microfiction is obviously becoming more popular as is certain forms of poetry as well because of changes in technology, changes in our lifestyle, changes in, in how we live, which make us focus much more on, on conveying information and, and narratives clearly and quickly and succinctly. And we, we tend to, you know, browse a lot more faster between a, a whole wide range of different sources of media a lot of the time. And often that's presented as being like an erasure that's destroying literature and literary culture, that we're losing this capacity for deep reading. But also this more kind of, I suppose, rapid moments of engagement and deep connection give rise or revive all the forms of literature. Because as you pointed out, microfiction has been around for a really long time. We just haven't always really called it microfiction. If we go back to you know, Aesop's fables, were arguably understood, could arguably understood now as, as works of microfiction, or um, a lot of, say, oral storytelling traditions where the story itself could be summarized very succinctly, but you tell it or as long or as short as you like, depending on, on the moment of the mood. So, yeah, there are a lot, there's a, you know, microfiction obviously has these, these very deep roots as well. Um, 
Yeah, it's just another another question coming at it from a slightly different angle. Um, both of you mentioned, you know, starting with a longer story sometime and occasionally having to whittle it back or pair it back to its most essential form. Have you ever found yourself experiencing kind of the, the opposite direction where you start working on a piece of microfiction and then you just find it, it leads to a longer story? So, Alice, you're nodding, perhaps? So. Yeah, definitely. I think it works both yeah. ways. I think for me, often, you know, I wish, yeah, I wish my writing supported me financially enough to just do that. But, you know, I'm, I work in the office and sometimes if you're on the train or, or whatever and you kind of experience this kind of little moment that you think is really quite powerful, um, I put it in my phone, even if it's just in my notes or, or sometimes tweet about it. And then um, some of my longer stories have actually really been um, they've grown from, from those notes in my phone or from Twitter um, because it's a really good way of kind of recording that image in a succinct way that's powerful to you to reread. And then um, you can kind of build upon that image and turn it into something bigger. And I think um, it's, also, micro nonfiction is a similar thing. A couple of essays that I've written, recently written have really started from an image that's kind of, kind of made my heart pull a little bit, and I've gone, I'll record that in a really like a small little way, and then um, turn it into something um, much longer, and use that small my, that small story as a basis to, some, to something longer. So, it definitely works um, um, both ways for me. Um, yeah. And that's interesting what you say about um, micro nonfiction as well. I mean, that's a topic I think that is um, not explored as much. But I mean, there's there's a few authors who have started writing like micro memoirs and that kind of thing as well, which are just um, Very interesting. Yeah, um, I don't remember the writer, but um, and then there's also, but there's also what we try to do with Stasia, um, flashes nonfiction. And the initial idea of that was was not so much um, memoir as it was to literally be more journalistic, to be yeah. you may not necessarily be interested in to read a whole article on, but um, like I mean, fifty to five hundred words. I mean, you could really inform someone about a topic and get them interested in a topic, um, an important topic in that time. Um, it hasn't got quite the same like, response. Like, we have had some incredible pieces on that, but um, and really powerful pieces. But um, it would be great to see the exploration of that. I think, you know, just of um, short journals. Yeah. yeah. I'm also really interested in, and I'm not sure what you guys do at at Seizure, but the way you can use shorter fiction and and use you can use different formats. So you could have hyperlinks embedded in the text to take, you know, if someone wants one version of the story, they can read the shorter story and then be taken on to, you know, down different paths to expand that that story. And I think that's a really exciting, um, kind of the digital space, it's a really exciting um, time for that stuff as well. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, there is kind of a connection probably with the hyperlink fiction where short stories are translated, you know, by a hyperlinks and non-linear patterns through through sites. I remember reading a story at one point that was just, you know, it started from a sentence on the page and then you clicked each word and it expanded as, as a narrative. And I could see something working quite wonderfully with a, a contraction of the story down to its essential singular initial yeah. sentence. Mm. So something we haven't talked about, and we're running a little bit low on, on time now, is but I, I did want to mention this panel is now getting into the very, very short um, end of the microfiction world, thinking about the conventions of, you know, there's We've talked a little bit about the 540 character story or the tweet that grabs your attention. And there's still conventions like the six word story or the eight word story. Um, have you, do you come across any of uh, works in this, this very sort of short end of the microfiction scale that grab your attention? And if so, what do they tend to do? How do they, they capture, you know, or, or generate an emotional effect from this, this very kind of concentrated um, expression? Any, anyone want to tackle that one? Alex, maybe I've got, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Um, well, in terms of ah, sorry. the submissions that we receive, we've never received um, anything that's eight words. Like, well, that I've, I've been doing for about a year and a bit now, like, and I've never yeah. never seen one at all. Yeah. And I, think, well, yeah, it's, it, I would love to receive some. You know, we would love to get some really short ones. And, um, and I think, 
yeah, some of it's incredible, like that one that you know, Alice, you just showed us on Twitter, you know, that's, I mean, it's just things yeah. that they just work, you know, and you wouldn't change a thing about them because they're just, um, they're kind of perfect little gems, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's it's something that's probably less explored than the 50 to 500 bracket. Um, but I think it has enormous potential. And I think it, it sort of, it, it just looks from like the images, poems, and, you know, like the models. So, like, you know, as the pounds are stationed in the next world and that kind of thing, it was um, just a couple of lines and those kind of things where it's just really focused on. Um, on a single single point. So, yeah. Yeah, it's generating their attention, and as we discussed earlier as well, I mean, people are sort of creating these these incredibly short stories all the time via social media and, and Twitter without necessarily realizing that. Alice, sorry, you you've already talked a little bit about about the way you monitor your social media feeds, but is there anything in particular that you look for or that that jumps out and creates that effect for you in terms of some very short prose? Um. I think it's kind of it's. Again, it, I guess it's subjective, but it, it really needs to make you feel something. Can't be overwritten. Can't be kind of underwritten. Um, there's one here that I just found from that same Josephine Rowe book that um, called Driver, and it just goes: um, the rain smells like salt. She keeps the window wound down. Her feet on the dash. And there's so many layers to that. You know, you know she's in the car. You know she's on a journey, and you know there's someone else in the car. And Josephine Rowe has this really beautiful way of just, you know, and I guess it's more realistic fiction, but just building this whole world around a, a really, really small, seemingly everyday experience where you kind of want to know more and you want to know, you know, where are they driving from, where are they driving to, and, and also that kind of real sensory experience too, which I think that you can kind of smell the salt in the air and, um, and yeah, I think that, it, short micro fiction as for me personally I like longer fiction to do the same thing you know like to, to make you feel something I think that, you know really really good longer short stories that are maybe 3,000 words can be broken up often can be broken up into to much smaller sections that on their own are really powerful as well so whether you want to write micro fiction or or longer fiction I think um, by doing either you're kind of practicing the other so yeah, yeah. I think it would be an interesting experiment if you like took a novel in the last paragraph of that novel and see if it could be a piece of hyperfiction, you know, because I think that's in a in a sense it's a you know it's a it'll have a resolution for one thing yeah, and it it's an interesting idea is how much you can sort of glean from that short amount of space about the novel in, in itself. So I think that could be an interesting Anyway, you think about writing, it's an interesting experiment. I think that would be a fascinating experiment, actually, is when we think about novels and long works of fiction, we often tend to focus on the opening paragraph. And, you know, we have all these lists going around, and we get the great first line, the great opening paragraph. And we actually think about, about where the story ends up and how it gets summarized and what final image the writer leaves with us. It really has to stand for, the, for that entire narrative. It has to tell us something about that world and those characters. And so, so shifting that focus and thinking about that, that final paragraph of the work of microfiction sounds like, you know, it would be a fascinating experiment to, to work with there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think um, I would just like kind of like, because I haven't done this yet, share like one of my favorite short, short stories, which is um, a piece by, by Dave Eggers that I throw up there. It's perhaps more along with in the kind of conventional end of, of realist kind of subject matter in microfiction. Um, but it just deals with a particular moment between two cousins on a road trip that, you know, where, where a character's feelings and emotions shifts um, in, in one particular moment. And it could never be the subject of a whole novel or a short story or a conventional short story even, but it's a moment or a change that um, a short, short story or a piece of my, or flash fiction can really just nail and, and, and capture and build an entire narrative out of that, that sort of slight emotional shift where unfairly perhaps and inexplicably one cousin starts to think differently about the other um, and it really for me captured that moment of you know of, of a shift or change in your emotions that you don't 
you, you know is irrational that you can't control anyway. So that's kind of a progress of nothing, but um, yeah, I just wanted to throw that one in there. Yeah. So I think we have about five minutes left. Um, would, would each of you perhaps like to maybe just kind of summarize what you, you feel is, is the most key or important advice you'd give for, for writers of microfiction? What, what do you, you feel are the, the, the kind of the key things that, that when you're thinking about writing a short, short story or flash fiction or even like, you know, a really short piece of microfiction you have to keep in mind as a writer? Um, maybe Alice, could we start with you? Yeah. Um... Well, I think you need to firstly read a lot. I think that really helps if you're, if you're kind of reading widely and, and people from all kinds of different cultures and and reading is you know, probably the best thing you can do. <laughs> but um, I think um, really make sure you're not trying to condense too much information into each of those, those eight words or 500 words or whatever. It really can just be a snapshot of a moment in time. And, um, and I think also really try and write without other people's kind of voices in your head. You know, don't don't try to write to to, to be the next Day Beggars or the next you know Josephine. Rowe. Really write from from your experience. And um, you know, I was I was I had Tony Birch as a lecturer for a long time, and and his kind of catch all is write what you know and write what what kind of rings you and. Um, um, write about subjects that are important to you, even if they don't, if they're not cool or they're not, you know, things that are meant to be written about in literary nonfiction or fiction or even absurdist. Yeah, really write about stuff that's, that's important to you, I guess. Yeah, wonderful. Perfect. Great. Um, and Alex? Yeah, I mean, I just uh, reinforce that. I mean, I obviously read um, a lot of microfiction as much as you can. Um, and also, like I was saying, the, the voice is really important. So it's, it's um, I think yeah. that's what we were trying to do. My conviction is like the voice yeah. is just paramount, you know. So um, I think, you know, also it's just because it's short doesn't mean you have to revise it a lot as well. You know, that's like small things. So make sure it's polished when you're sending it off. That kind of thing. So make sure you've, um, if you're, you're analyzing every word and every line, all the stuff you do with short fiction and poetry anyway. But, um, yeah, that's, that's a yeah. yeah, so I suppose it's that question of, you know, which we always should be asking ourselves in any kind of piece of fiction that we're writing, do I really need this sentence? Do I really need this line? How much can be conveyed? It, you know, and, and yep. Yeah, um, and as I often tell students who are writing conventional short stories, when they come to the end of writing this piece, I mean, that's the time actually where they have to ask to put plot down on the paper, but they have to actually ask, what is the story about? Um, and that's the time when they start going back and rethinking it and focusing in on the theme, on the real kind of image or idea that they want to convey to the reader. That's the same process with microfiction, only, you know, that, that center of the story might just be the, um, the yeah, a few lines or a paragraph or even a single sentence. Um, so I think you know, as a writer, it can be, it can be a really powerful, useful exercise to think through in that respect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think we have like just a couple of minutes left on the clock. Um, are there any kind of final thoughts that you'd like to share about about microfiction as a form or directions that we're taking? I've got a few of my favourite books. So. Uh, yeah, but Yep, yep. Um, Clementine von Radix, she's amazing. I found out about her on Instagram and she does really beautiful, really short, um, raw microfiction. Um, again, um, Josephine Rowe for some longer stuff that, because I was kind of talking that longer stuff can also be cut down and even reading longer short stories can be inspiring for micro um, fiction. I've got Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. So it's called That Thing Around Your Neck. It's a really beautiful, important collection of, of stories. And also one of my favourites is um, Deborah Levi. She's a beautiful writer. She's written a collection called Black Vodka that really, really changed my life from reading. But um, the quote on the front of this book is, um, to become a writer I have to learn to interrupt, to speak up, to speak a little louder and then louder and then just to speak in my own voice, which is not that loud at all. And I thought... That's a really good point to be like what we were talking about before is that you don't necessarily have to be the loudest voice to be to be good. And, yeah. and she writes fiction as well. 
Um, and again, just to say again, um, your Asa Daily Ward's amazing, or Sunshine is amazing, and I really encourage everyone to look those guys up as well. Fantastic, great, thanks. Uh, and Alex, maybe just a final thought or two, or? Um, yeah. No, I mean, I just think it's something that everyone should have a go at writing. I think, I mean, we've sort of covered it all, but I, I think microfiction is, is a real, it's a different experience to writing any other kind of fiction or, or poetry. It's its own, it is its own thing. And I think, um, you know, the ideas that come through and the, the messages are, um, are different and important. So yeah, that's all I have. Great, thanks. Okay, and I think we're just about out of time, so it's been a great conversation. Um, thank you both Alex and Alice for, for joining me to, to talk about microfiction today. And thanks for everybody who's, who's tuned in to catch this, this talk. Um, hopefully you'll be sticking around and catching some more panels at the uh, Digital Writers Festival this year. Um, thanks you all. Brilliant. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks. <laughs> all right.